Thanks for being here. Small note, but uh, I'll do what I can uh, to share uh, my journey with Fridges. They are a smallish uh, software services firm. Right now, about 125 people. Um, about so this year, this current financial year, we probably will be 175, 200 odd. That's a pretty small, fair, mid-sized sort of firm. My, my journey is, uh, you know, we were formed in 2002, and so I, I really, I'm really inspired to share how we pulled up Srijan from uh, a struggling firm in, you know, 2010 and turned it around to uh, a fairly successful company with high profitability and rapidly growing in all of that. Uh, early last year, now we are in a good, strong path of uh, uh, you know, high profitability. So, who is this talk for? This is for largely for CEOs and managers in smallish software companies, mid-size, and looking to find predictability in revenues. It is also for sales and pre-sales leaders, managers, developers who are looking for tools for uh, you know selling agile contracts. Really. So I have some tools around it, I have some learning, I have my story to share. And hopefully it's useful for all of you here. And maybe you can take it to your companies and you know, use some of these tools. So uh, I'm going to set a little context here. So we are, we are formed in 2002 and uh, you know, we're all, always an open source company, uh, uh, content management systems largely. By 2006, there was a CMS called Typo3, and we had become synonymous in India with Typo3, uh, very popular in Europe. Uh, we are right now Asia's largest Drupal company. You don't know how many of you know Drupal at all? Anybody? Okay, good. So uh, it's a content management system. It's open source, uh, very rapidly growing. Whitehouse.gov is on Drupal. MyGov.in, Naring Modi's pet project is on Drupal. We actually built a large part of it. So uh, we are right now almost entirely Drupal, and we moved to drop everything else, all the other technologies, and focused on doing one thing well in 2010. And really, it was that period when uh, you know we also started running into uh, severe problems uh, in our finances and how the company was run. And I'll share why. 2011, I you know shared a little bit about this journey, uh, how that started changing. Um, where we are right now is that we are in massive expansion mode. We are expanding the U.S., setting up offices all over the country and so on and so forth. So with that context, uh, but of course, all of this success did come easy. And here is where we were some time ago. We were in 2002, 6, we were 10, 15 um, people uh, at best. There were short-term projects which were fairly profitable, to be honest. Uh, there were mostly incoming leads, largely all Europe, and we were among the first to implement open source content management in some large enterprises in India like Airtel. Airtel.in ran on our implementation, and we actually helped IBM way, way back then to implement a good CMS. So we've always been very, very strong with content management systems. But as project size, sizes started increasing, uh, and you know, going from smallish five, six, eight week, 10 week projects, going up to six uh, months sort of sizes, we started failing very badly. And that was a period which was extremely tough. We lost all our money in trying to scale up the company. We were growing up, growing and trying to do these projects well. They were largely all fixed cost projects. Um, always, we ran into incorrect estimations. Uh, the tail of the projects ended, uh, I mean, lasted endlessly. Every people would be working, you know, the 80% of the bulk of the project would be over, but developers would keep working endlessly for a few months and changes would come in. And we had no clue how to manage all of those changes. And everything was obvious for customers. Well, this was obvious. This was already discussed. You remember that conversation on so-and-so day? It was the same story all over and over again. And every time nobody else paid, the client didn't pay. Yes, there were delayed projects, but we bore the brand financially. And there was no developer morale, uh, was fin finger pointing among sales and developers. There were financial constraints which were leading to you know, staffing developers on multiple projects. So in a single day, a developer, 
to the first we were when we ended up with one person team sometimes or two people teams, right? And then they were doing two projects in a single day or in a single week they were hopping between projects. Then suddenly there would be a support request coming and okay, why don't you two guys just handle the support request and tomorrow we get back on the project? You know, all this nonsense was happening all over the place. And obviously, low leadership morale. I was devastated. I didn't know what to do with all of this. And uh, poor financial health. And it was literally a crisis all over. But then, obviously, I was searching, hunting, and you know, famous Paulo Silva statements. Uh, statement: The universe conspires to help you achieve or get out of whatever you want to do. And so, I was at a NASCOM conference at Emerge Out, and I heard this um, somebody on the podium say that Infosys knows its revenues two years ahead. And you know, we we were a project project to project company, and with NASCOM mentoring, we changed that. We figured out how do we get into contracts, move away from being a project company. And I was like, okay, that's exactly what I want to do. And you know, how do I negotiate such contracts? How do I find such customers who who will uh, you know be engaged with us in long term? In the meantime, um, you know, Avinash is. Moved to Goa, uh, but he's been actually. If he were here, he would probably be giving a talk at this conference as well. Uh, leading uh, agile coach used to, I think, be the director of agile transformation at a company called Zebia. We had started engaging Avinash in, uh, you know, teaching or coaching our teams in, in implementing Scrum. We had multiple coaching sessions with him across the teams, different topics, and so on and so forth. Um, Meanwhile, uh, you know, we had we are not a centralized sort of company, so we are pretty flexible with opening offices anywhere. And we had set up a Dharamsala office in Himachal, and uh, you know, because of that, Nareesh Jain, who organized the uh, Agile Con, he actually asked me to come and give a talk on distributed sort of startups. We opened the uh, Dharamsala office as a separate company under the same brand kind of a thing. So we were very intrigued by it. We said, Why don't you talk about it? And you know, over there, I ran into these really great coaches from all over the world and shared our problems and all of that. And you know, standard answers, but now they seem very trivial. That time it was almost like a revelation. Then break your projects down, do three phases, do a discovery, do a paid discovery. I was like, really? Are people going to pay for um, you know doing a specification for them? And um, he said, well, you know, you have to try and you have to find those right customers. So it's easier said than done, but when you go back to your business, look at who your prospects are and are they going to pay for discovery exercises or, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So, um, meanwhile, what had happened, and going back to Paulo Silo, we got a phone call and turned out to be a large, very large management consulting firm, I can't name it. Um, they, they wanted Drupal and you know, they said that, uh, you know, we found you guys on the net, we gave a phone call. And Met them, and what that led to was they, you know, we, because of Avinash, we'd already started thinking agile and implementing a few practices. And as most entrepreneurs do, if you're doing that much, you say, no, no, we are like that much, you know, everything is agile, and all of that. And they loved us. They said, well, very good. This fits very well into our culture and all of that. Why don't we start working on small projects? So, and there we were, started working with them, and that that organization offered the financial cushion to us to start negotiating agile contracts. Um, you know, so our first breakthrough came, and so what, what started happening was I started refusing to do fixed cost projects, even some very large engagements. We had the potential to serve, uh, uh, or revamp an entire product which served half a billion ads in Singapore, and uh, very large engagement, but the people wouldn't budge. They said, no, we, if there are three other companies who are giving a quote, why can't you guys give a quote? They said, well, what do you, you know, you want us to give a quote for an eight, ten month project, and I don't know the team size, I don't know the intricacies of the product. Well, come and find out, I'll give you two days and give us a quote. So I had to challenge them, cuddle them, coach them, educate them. If things wouldn't work, I would walk out of such projects. Very stressful period, uh, because everybody, you know, um, in the leadership team started saying, this guy's going to kill the company completely. Already we are in trouble and now it's not going to go like this. So, but I had to take that stand and um, it's a very interesting quote that uh, the job of a leader is to, uh, you know, show people where we are right now and where we can go and how are we going to get there. And so 
So that was all things that I had to keep doing all along during that period. And I had to show them that we have to move to agile contracts. This is temporary stress. We've got to come out of it. And we did, of course. Um, but yeah, so clients started telling us that you know your refusal to work with us uh, in any other way than how you are saying, and you're so confident about it. Um, you know, we love your integrity. You're willing to let us go. The others are all over the place. We say this, and they say yes. And so, you know, they said we want to work with you, even though we, we know we are getting into, you know, PNM or whatever. We don't know what we are getting into, but we are willing to work with you. So they love the integrity of, you know, of that pitch. And more and more clients started, you know, falling in, uh, you know, started agreeing to, to such a model of working. Um, and meanwhile, Avinash, who I talked about earlier, had actually moved out of his company and started engaging with us to coach us. So it was all serendipity, you know, sort of happening together. The events started falling in place. And uh, what was changing now? We were now staffing teams on projects. We weren't, uh, we were looking at all the roles across, you know, that the project needs. And we said, here is an entire team which is going to be staffed in the world. It did end up being expensive for a lot of clients, but I had to constantly show them reason why this was important. And the good part was we'd already started, you know, built a lot of trust with a few customers, just a few customers. So instead of 20 customers, we were probably serving three now, four. But we were doing a much better job with them, and there was much better profitability because of that. Of course, we were going to make things. Uh, clients were way more engaged. Constantly, we were telling them that, OK, here is an article we had. Here is a video that we saw on who, how, what a good product owner is. And we were constantly getting into engagements like that. Did we also have our fixed cost mess alongside somewhere? Yes, a little bit of that was already going on. But that was a smaller part of the company. And of course, had better cash flows. Uh, project changes were being managed way better than ever. We've generally always been a techie company, and uh, you know managers have always been looked down upon uh, for some reason. Uh, actually, our focus on tech has been too strong, tech delivery managers. So that was one of the reasons that we never had all this change management process, you know, in place very nicely. Everything is a document and all of that. So, but with with Scrum teams, uh, changes could be managed way more easily with self-organizing teams, and our culture has always been like that with self-organizing. Do things yourself. Everyone is exposed to clients. Um, people talk. If even in broken English, you're encouraged to talk, not hidden behind project managers. And so it fit in our philosophy very well. You know? And that is why the turnaround was easy. It wasn't easy, but it happened. Yeah. So, um, so I'm sorry about that. There was no more one project, no one person. Uh, uh, one person teams, there were longer term contracts, uh, there was much higher employee engagement and uh, uh, satisfaction, even the leadership. We had bigger talk on it right now. So, some takeaways you know, my talk came sooner than the time, and if you guys have questions, then we can talk about it. So, uh, I read somewhere in one of the presentations that agile is not agile without agile contracting. And every time, even today, you know, every day in a sales cycle, I keep running into these sort of conversations. So we would get into a client saying that, um, yeah, so we're agile. Say, oh, yes, we love agile. But how much is this project going to cost? Like, OK, you know, why don't we you know, do a little discovery? And um, you know, this is such a big product. And how can we like, upfront tell you what, what it is going to cost? And the standard answer is, oh, well, there are three other agencies who've done it. You know, why can't you say all of this? Why can't you give a cost? And so, um, and then the conversation starts. So I try to dig in and I try to say, are you actually doing an apples to apples comparison? That you somebody told you X hours and you know it's going to take Y time and so and so money to build? Yes, of course. You know that's a standard answer. But then you know what we have to very often we started doing now being a software services company, smaller, smallish, whatever. Either you can. You know, if, if there is no agile maturity in clients, you can endlessly try and coach them. Uh, very often, the sales cycle can be very tough here, very long and elongated and tough. Or you can start throwing some numbers. And how we started throwing numbers was that we started adding, making staffing sheets like these. 
and we said, okay, two weeks discovery. This is a very short project, but even in that, we started doing it. So we said that two weeks discovery, and we believe it's going to be eight weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks, whatever. And this is just based on past experience. Two guys sat down and they said, oh, we've done a project like this, so and so place, and it took us 16 weeks. So it's going to be 16 weeks of development, and then some time for doing production and some cleaning, and whatever else. So small project, that's why the, the weeks are, you know, sort of in line with how the size of the project. And when we started going back with these, uh, 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 you know, these estimates, then then the conversation started changing to, oh man, this is too high. Even our UK vendor is cheaper than you guys. So then the conversation would shift to sure, but uh, they can't be certainly charging rates higher than us, right? And so what's wrong? And uh, you know, so then I would tell them that look, we've staffed an entire team, and here is our Excel sheet. And we actually, I would actually go out to tell them, tell them the names of the people who would be joining this team if you were to sign up by so and so date. And so they would say, well, that's your business model. I don't care. And I would turn around and tell them, Bet, you better care. Because if somebody has given you a cost without telling you who is going to work on the project, or at least what role is going to work on the project, and the occupancy that they're going to be occupied with, you and your project are going to be in trouble. Do you expect? Um, your teams to be working on two projects simultaneously, and obviously the answer is no. So then, what else? What? How? How have they given you an estimate? Well, that's your business model, and you know all this resistance constantly. And my challenge in the sales process is to break down that barrier. Is to say that tell me another way of doing this, and they can't come up with another way. They have to go back to their vendors and say that look, this is the only way. What are you staffing? And when they start doing a rates comparison. Clearly, you know, projects are, they haven't, you know, people just throw numbers in the air. And this is a problem with agencies, you know, small software services companies all over the place. We run into companies from UK, US, Singapore, everywhere who do just throw numbers in the air. And so I've made it a mission for myself to go and coach local companies that we compete with to move away from all of this nonsense, right? So I keep talking at different Rubicons in London, and Singapore, and US, everywhere about moving away from this. Of course, those guys have their own challenges because they don't have the scale that we, we can achieve here. So they've got to do some functions like that constantly. Anyhow, so, um, you know, this sort of, the, the selling becomes extremely, it has to be extremely convincing. And so for that reason, you know, it has to be very solution-based selling uh, very often. You've got to be, the salesperson has got to be able to talk about um, uh, you know, why a certain team is needed. If, if there is front end needed, why is it needed? Why is it needed in a certain occupancy? And we made a thumb rule, if I go back to my uh, sheet, we said even in small projects, you know, normally in our, in our, my business, people don't want to pay for quality. They don't want to pay for a quality assurance engineer on their team. So we, we try and, you know, push it down uh, to say 50%. There is some front-end work, which is 50%. I know my agile coach, Avi, just doesn't like this, but you know, we have to do some things like that. Because I think in some roles, we are able to leverage people across a couple of projects. We are able to split their times, OK? So either, either in, especially in small projects. We just do that in all these eight-week kind of projects. It's manageable when they are small, side build sort of projects. Any long-term contracts that we have, which is about 60 70% of the company, there are one, two, or more uh, quality assurance engineers, manual, automation, full 100% books, scrum masters, and all of that. We don't have the leverage of larger companies like Tesco to you know, have 120 people team because they're all serving internal clients, right? We have to go find business. And we've got to find business. We've got to compete in the industry out there. And because of the challenges I shared with customer education, it's not easy. And so we've got to optimize things. I don't know if people who are totally agile here will like this or not, but we've got to optimize. Um, the other thing is that if... Uh, Excuse uh, me. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So uh, two questions, basically. Uh, a, what, what are activities do you do in the discovery phase? I believe you're treating discovery as a pre-death. Uh, so what are the activities you do in the discovery phase? So we phase? have two... Just and, sorry, go ahead. And the second question, which, is the, uh, which I'm going to for last one. Let's say you've committed to a client that, okay, you know, this is going to be the project, it's going to be two weeks of discovery, it's going to be like eight weeks of development and so on and so forth. What if you discuss
discovered during discovery that oh, you know, the work is actually of 16 weeks or 12 weeks or you know, much more than what you anticipate. Yeah, so the how, how does your how does your contracts account for that? Yeah. So the purpose of discovery is with that conversation that we pay for the discovery and we discover whether we can do this in eight weeks or ten weeks or twelve. So, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I mean, the way I understand it, you signed your contract after the two week discovery period. We, we, so see the challenge is that very often uh, when we work with, uh, so 8, 10 week, 15 week, these kind of projects happen with a lot with uh, internationally when you're subcontracted or uh, when you're working with uh, non profits and some other people wherever they need to clear budgets of flat. So for the budget clearance, we would tell them that, okay, here is some estimate, and we do some estimates and say, okay, this could be 12 to 16 weeks. Here is a 12-week sort of budget, but we can only know whether it's 12 or 10 or 16 or even 18 if once we do the discovery, and typically we would do two weeks, first of all engagement. What do we do is another question. I'll come to that and maybe try and tie the string pieces together. So, there are three kinds of discoveries that we do. One is for very large product engagements, very large engagements, which could run into multi-year contracts. And uh, where the idea is on a napkin, really. Or the guy has, you know, I want to build something like this. We try and vet the client. We try and see that where, where is this source of funding? Is he you know, putting his own money? Or does he have a venture back funding? Or uh, is it a running business? And we generally don't end up working with individuals who are funding it themselves. So we, them go. But if they are well funded organizations who are building their own product, then we would do, you know, um, get into a prototyping exercise. Now that discovery is never two weeks. Okay? So that is a prototyping exercise which can take up to six to ten weeks and takes three people, two to three very hard, rapid prototyping JavaScript kind of people who would ideate on whiteboards, constantly share screens, screenshots with the client, you know, very mature. You require very mature client on the other side, even if they are remote sitting in a different geography. And uh, towards the end of the six, eight weeks, of course, you know, doing very hard demos every three days, five days, every week, uh, we would come up with working prototypes of the entire product as they imagined it. This allows them to go to their clients very early on and get feedback. Right? We've now done this several times over. And that's a, that, that is success we achieve a lot. And those are bigger discoveries. Then there are different kinds of discoveries. The second kind is when they come up with, they have already invested in systems and they're broken systems. Um, they want us to invest, investigate if they, we can fix them for them you know, and get them working and they have lots of enhancements. There, we end up taking three weeks, four weeks sometimes, you onboard code, we look at code, we run some performance tests, we do all of that. Then there are smaller projects where we simply build backlogs, right? They have UI designs already, or we don't engage unless UI designs are done and stuff like that, or we do them in a separate print exercise and all. And then we build backlogs and, you know, write, build some story, do some story point estimation and go back to them, but here is what it would cost. But what's what's important is to change in a selling process. It's important to change the kinds on conversation. It's the so I you know I go and tell them that your the way you need to choose your vendor is not by uh, the price but, and you know yes you vet it quality you vet it the management really but nothing more than that. Please shortlist make a shortlist of two or three vendors. Do uh, a discovery with them and see how it goes. Every single time that Srijan has done a discovery, except once we've lost a project. And we've competed with US companies, UK, everywhere. Our discovery is so strong that during the middle of the... So, so you are saying, uh, um, so just a follow up question. So you are saying that uh, when you approve the clients, you tell them to go for a discovery contract first. Yes. At the end of discovery, you will sign a contract for the yes, uh, entire project. Yes, that's correct. But for some budgeting, we tell them that here is a budget, you should start thinking about it. Yeah? Okay. But, but that numbers. budgeting that budget is not tied to the contract. It's so not they, 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 they don't about. sign a long term contract. You sign a contract only, only for after the discovery. discovery. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And we also tell them that the, you know we are happy if you want to walk away with the outcomes of this discovery and not work with us. That's fine. Only once they have walked away, every single time. So coming back to uh, 
you know, organization values. Am I good on time? Uh, so it's somewhat of my own version of what uh, Agile values stand for. It requires empowered teams. It requires courage in teams uh, to express dissent, to disagree. And so, in my opinion, no Agile can be Agile uh, you know, without the organization values aligned with uh, Agile principles. So you can run all the ceremonies, you can run scrum ceremonies, but if people don't express dissent, if you, so every time, you know, unfortunately, very often when we are hiring, we keep running into people who are very superficial in their scrum understanding. Uh, it's unfortunate part of the industry, and you know, I don't know, that's not the conversation I'm having right now, but there's no courage, the organizations don't express dissent, allow expression of dissent or challenging. Uh, they have very little financial transparency. So all the projects, all the teams, whether developers or managers, know what this project costs. And they have to actively keep on top of budgets. Actively during their retros or during two weeks, they, they actually see that how much budgets have been burned for the client. They actually actively send out emails, send out emails to clients saying that here is what's remaining from your original budget you, you, you scoped for. And people know rates and whatever else. And, you know, that I think that's an important part of uh, uh, organization value alignment. Um, decision making has to be fast. People have to be encouraged to take wrong decisions if they have to take decisions. Wrong decisions can be corrected, but no decisions got everybody will that. Uh, there has to be an extreme focus on learning and continuous development. Learning is is in different ways. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, I'll just go. Okay. Right. Learning is uh, is in English speaking. Is in writing better emails. It, it can be in coaching skills. It can be in, of course, technology. It can be in, of course, agile. But this is a learning is, is is overall. You have to learn to take feedback. You have to learn to give feedback. And all of these are these are gaps. These are personality gaps in people. Uh, and organizations have to constantly coach and train their people and leadership in the way all of this. So, um, you know, excellence is a very strong word, but we use that region. We don't use excellence, we use continuous improvement. So, we don't care where we are. As long as the person, when we hire, as long as the person shows a hunger to learn, we are willing to get that person because those people will continuously improve. That's important for us. I want to come to, uh, uh, you know, do you, do you know activity maps? This is Michael Porter's activity map, which we are sort of This is Southwest Airlines. And uh, very important sort of uh, map to make a strategy of an organization. And you know, so just to, it's a low cost airline. I'm just giving this as an example. It's a low cost airline. So limited service. They will not give food. They don't even have seats uh, allocated. You walk in and you know, it's funny when you're traveling in the US, if you go to a Southwest Airlines uh, plane, you will have the aisle and the window seat taken. All the middle seats are empty. So if you're boarding late, you have to go and find a middle seat somewhere. So uh, very low ticket prices, very efficient, on-time types. Indigo keeps copying them. They've already copied. Yeah, but the culture they have not been able to copy. It's going to be difficult to copy that culture. They're a very, yeah. So I mean, I tried to make a strategy map of uh, Srijan, and there's a reason I'm showing this. I'm not trying to sell Srijan or whatever here. But, um, and this, and I'm trying to tie this to, you know, agile principles. So if teams have to be, if, if you want to deliver good customer experience to, you know, in, in your products, you want to deliver value to them. If you want to deliver value first, you've got to be, you've got to care for what you're delivering. Yeah, which means you've got to really be focused on their business and ensure that they are doing well and your teams are aligned to all of those values, right? They, you can't be concerned about us. You have to be concerned about them also. And they bring, bring lean thinking and you know, minimum viable products and you are actually hitting your own financials because you're telling them that, look, maybe this, what you're trying to build is way too much and it's unnecessary for you. I think you should cut the product down. We have those conversations actively with our clients. So you focused on customer experience. For that, you can't do that until you have empowered teams. Teams who who build their own brand, who make independent decisions, who have a deep sense of ownership of client success, who express dissent, talk, have courage, and all of that. 
uh, you can't have those kind of people if you constantly don't invest in them, in their learning, in their English, in their in their communication, like Hindi or English or whatever, in their leadership training, in, in coaching them. You you can't have everybody pakaya and come and come and work in an organization. So you've got to completely invest. It training must be a light line item on your budget. It has to be. There is no and a significant line item. If it's not, then I don't believe the organization can claim to be a learning organization. Your sales process has to be consultative. It cannot be a, one of those, you know, salespeople who will sell an egg or a software doesn't make a difference. Really. You can't have that. And every time we've hired salespeople like that, we fail. Because, you know, these guys can't have a straight conversation with the client, the clients get put off. They see a massive gap between the first person who entered the office and you know the guy who is finally trying to sell. So all of that has to be aligned, and which once again requires coaching. These consultative salespeople must be aligned to selling agile contracting. They must be able to have those convincing conversations with clients on who's going to be staffed and why and it's all those problems. And of course, there is the entire design and lead delivery process, and everything ties around this. Yeah, and that's why. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, 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 the question I have is probably, uh, you know, uh, how do you uh, manage your change management here? Because after your discovery phase, uh, what my understanding so far is you, you, uh, you, you kind of uh, decide that this is what my scope of work would be. And based on that, you gave a quotation to your uh, client and you signed again a contract that these many weeks uh, we'll be working. So how do you manage that? I mean, yeah. uh, because again, uh, as per my understanding, it will not be full-flown written in blood and so on and so forth. How do you do Question. that? So once again, you know, coming back to the two kinds of, or three kinds of uh, discoveries that we would do, if you do a prototype, it's, it's clearly a big product. So let me, I can give a case. So we did a prototyping exercise started somewhere in June last year for one client, and very big client. And uh, I think eight weeks or something, we had the entire prototype complete. And then this person went out and you know gave a presentation in Miami to the, his audience and got feedback and said, well, the market wasn't ready for 60% of the product. And so they came back and slashed it out. So firstly, we did another small exercise to help them slash it out, you know, and reorienting the schemes to say that, okay, this is the product we now want. Now, clearly, what had to be built wasn't, so the client had a deadline all this took up some time and they had a deadline to launch by November 18th yeah, because of some conferences and others coming up. So we had the time bound thing. And so clearly, you know, because of our engagement with the client, this was very easy sale. They knew that you know, this is not a small product and this is going to go on. It's not going to stop anywhere. But let's find a budget for three months. Let's work backwards on what is the right team we need to have and make some adjustments of scaling up, scaling down. The, the first team people during the three months, three, three and a half months. So you work with that and you sign up SOW for that, for example. Right? So you say that here is where we want to get on until 18th November, here is minimum seven, eight people that you need in all the team, different roles. And so you sign an SOW for that with an understanding clearly that this is not going to stop. And we will decide uh, you know, the team that is going to be engaged after that. As we go along, let's start building. You don't have to close every conversation up front. But that's important, right? You've got to be able to build trust with that client to have those conversations. And they must trust you deeply. So pretty much, uh, if I understand correctly, so it's like a pay-as-you-go uh, kind of a thing. You said that, okay. Yeah, but you keep signing different SMTs. Fair enough, fair yeah. enough. So, so yeah. probably you, yourself, uh, the good thing which I like about this is what you just said, is that you help the client to say, hey, why do you really need it till November 18th? So they felt confidence in you that you are not trying to sell everything yeah. to them. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Probably so that if they say we have a deadline, so we just say, okay, good. So let's it's just work them on everything. And after that, as we go along, let's look at you know, how you want to do it. And obviously, we, are, we know we've had a conversation, I'm sure that fearless conversation, that this is, you're not looking at the product stopping on November 18th, right? You want it to continue, but let's see how things go. Fair. Yeah. And as you start getting success, you know, one or two, four to six weeks before that, you start talking about the next phases. How are you now thinking about it? Okay, sure. Uh, just one uh, small question. I'm feel free not to answer in case it's too, uh, you know, uh, and really a business. 
how do you do prototypes? Is it a high fidelity mockup using Xure or some of those? Well, that is one way, but generally we prefer using Angular JS and build out the entire working prototype in Angular JS and HTML. Angular JS and HTML. So quickly to end, um, you know, being agile, I have already shared some of this from the strategy map. It's about empowering teams, solution selling, constant learning and training. You know, we have an English teacher who comes every Wednesday to our office, and there's a group of people who study English every week. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> huh? So yeah, and, and people take leadership. Recently they came to me that you know there are people walking in, walking out, and it's disturbing us. So you know they agreed that we are four people. So I said, fine, just shove everybody else out. So they drew up a list of 13 people who were regular, who were going to attend, and they shoved everybody else out. They wrote a mail that everybody else is not welcome. I mean, that's an interesting practice. Did you ever felt any resistance from any employee or something? I mean, uh, who said that, uh, sir, you don't have English in class, you don't have English in class, you don't have English in in fact, they are very strong, clearly, they all realize that everybody realizes, but yes, when we ask for volunteers and then see who is willing, we send people to British Council Library to do their interests, but see everything when it's on a platter, generally people don't take it, they are changing a little bit. How do you hire people, is it the pressures or do you hire people? That's about it. I mean, then there's a lot of learning, like I said, is about coaching skills, and mostly among leadership, team leaders. You know, if you want to be a leader of a team, leadership is about influencing people. It's many coaching skills. That's the most difficult part. There are very smart people who, who don't like the idea of coaching. It's really hard. But that's a challenge. So, once again, that's why. You know, Agile cannot be one piece running, and you cannot have authoritative people running an Agile team. It's stupid. It doesn't fit. So you've got to have people oriented around that, with that personality. That's sort of about it. And the appraisals, by the way, we're actually very hard working on our appraisal system to encourage team behavior, and then measure teams instead of individuals. It's very difficult. And, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, it has to align with Agile, the entire organization culture. Are we Agile now? Yes, we are. But are we, is there massive scope of improvement? Obviously, we haven't had everything sorted out, so we're constantly that. Generally, that's my contact.